Good morning and welcome to River Gum Online. My name is Edwina Blair and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. We're continuing with our family series today. And uh, one of the other things that's going to be special about this morning's service is that we have a missions update from uh, an area of Uganda where our church is involved. And we're going to hear about what is taking place in Wakisa in Uganda. So I hope you're looking forward to that. You know, during this family series, we've been talking so much about the importance of family. And if you call River Gum your family, church family home, then we would like you to, to complete the family contact form, which you would have been sent through the e-news that you would have received um, on Friday. So this just allows us to, to be able to connect with you easily, to be able to care for you if there's anything that you need. And so we'd really ask that each family who calls River Gum their church family home will actually complete this family contact form. If you've got any questions at all, you can just contact Troy and talk to him about that. You know, in uh, hopefully soon, we will actually be starting to talk more and more about our move to our new site at Kajagong. But in preparation for that, we've got a working bee coming up, two working bees in fact, which we'd love for you to be involved in. So on Saturday the 10th of October and Saturday the 17th of October from eight in the morning till noon, we would love for you to be involved in uh, the, all the work that needs to start to take place at that Kajagong site. So uh, there's more information in your e-news and again, you can contact Troy if you've got any questions about that. But we would love for as many people as possible to help do some of the manual labor that we need to uh, start doing at our new Kajagong site, which is really exciting. It'll be wonderful just to be on that site uh, and just think about the future that awaits us as River Gum. One last thing I want to remember, remind you is just e-news. The best way to find out what is going on in the life of our church, to get all the links, uh, all the information is through our e-news. So if you haven't signed up for that, go to our website and you can do that there. So that's enough from me. I think it's time for us to worship together and just continue to be gathering online as our family this morning. Well, good morning, Rivergum, and welcome to Virtual Church. It's fabulous to be here to worship our God in these crazy and weird times. What prophetic words for us all. No weeping, no hurt or pain, no suffering. You hold me now.
about our River Gum Church family is that we are a generous church and in a moment we are going to continue our worship through our giving but before that I want to just remind you about another way in which we can be generous and to give to others and that's through Operation Christmas Child. So Operation Christmas Child is an opportunity for us to to fill these boxes with our gifts for our children overseas who don't have um, very much at all and so at Christmas we can bless them with these gifts and uh, we send them over and Operation Christmas Child is run by Samaritan's Purse and it's been going for many, many years and it blesses many, many children. So if you'd like to participate in this, you can drop into the church office between business hours, uh, give Troy a call to make sure that uh, it's a good time to pop in and you can pick up these boxes to fill and we need to return them by the 18th of October. If you can't fill a, a box yourself or if that's not something that you're able to do this year but you'd still like to be involved there's information in e-news uh, about a virtual box pack that you can still be involved in so check that out in your e-news now we're going to be generous now with our giving uh, a part of our worship where we give uh, to the ministry of river gum as an expression of our love adoration and worship of our God so if you've given this week or if you're planning to um, during the, the forthcoming week or fortnight you know, the banking details are on the screen and we would love for you to, to participate in this act of worship together with us. So I'm going to pray for our offering right now. So I ask that you join with me in this prayer. Lord God, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to give. Not only opportunities to bless others through things like Operation Christmas Child, but also to, to give through our tithes and our offerings that we do when we gather together. And even though right now we are gathering in a different way, we can still give. We thank you for the technology that allows us to still contribute to the ministry of River Gum Church. And so that we ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings that we are going to give now uh, and in the future. And we just thank you and praise you for what this means, for your work, your kingdom work in this place that you've planted us. Amen. Hi, River Gum family. It's Greg from the missions team again and today I'm just wanted to show you how to find missions information on the River Gum website. When you go to the River Gum homepage you'll see that there's a menu along the top and if you hover over ministries uh, you'll see that the second option is River Gum missions and if you click that you'll go to the missions main page. At the top, you'll see that there is a brief explanation of our vision for missions and then the six logos representing our current partners. There's a Live Connection, uh, which supports ch church pastors in Africa and Asia to watch over their flock and spread the good news of Jesus. Then there's uh, Wakisa Ministries, which ministers to pregnant teenage girls in Kampala, Uganda. Empart is an amazing evangelistic ministry working in northern India and aims to plant 30,000 
new church communities by 2030. The Good News team ministers to children all over Thailand through school visitations and a correspondence Bible study program which brings many to a knowledge of the love of Jesus. Kairos Prison Ministry works in prisons all around Australia, bringing the good news to inmates as well as their family and friends on the outside. We are also sponsoring four young kids through Compassion, three in Thailand and one in Rwanda. We do this through our financial support as well as letter writing. Finally, there's Operation Christmas Child run by Samaritan Purse. We encourage Rivergum families to fill shoeboxes with gifts for kids which are delivered around Christmas time and show them that they are loved. So let's click on the Wakisa logo and that takes you to their specific page where you'll see more information about them plus the latest news. So we hope that you'll go to the missions pages often and read what's happening in the world of missions because of the financial support that we can offer as a congregation. And finally today we're going to run a short two-minute video created by Wakisa Ministries to showcase how they are progressing in building a new facility so that they can increase their capacity from 30 girls to 50 girls at any one time and perhaps even be able to perform deliveries on site rather than sending the girls to hospital. So, bye for now, and we trust that you'll be inspired by this video. Greetings to you all from Wakesa Ministries, Kampala, Uganda. I would love to give you an update as partners of this organization, Wakesa. And firstly, I want to thank you ever so much for your love, your prayers, your support on a quarterly basis, on a monthly basis to this organization. You have enabled us to further our vision. The vision of Wakisa Ministries is to have a generation free from the impact of early sexual behavior, living with hope through the gospel of Jesus Christ to have a brighter future. Since the lockdown, we have received so many girls and they're on the waiting list. And the youngest during the last two weeks is 12 years. And because of that, we feel we need to expand. And that is where the new center comes in. I want to tell you that we have started with a new center. We have four blocks that we need to put on this new center. We have to enlarge, expand because we need more room. And we have completed the dormitory. And that dormitory will take in 50 girls. We are praying that we can also complete the health facility and the administration block. The teaching facility where the dining hall is, is the next phase. And we have raised them enough money to take it from the foundation and build a superstructure. And that's it. It's my prayer that we can raise more money to complete not only the teaching facility, but the other blocks. May God bless you so much. Thank you very much. We love you. Hello again. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us for River Gum Online this week. And whether or not you're new to River Gum or new for this series, you've chosen to join us for a great week as we continue our series that's called The Family. Now, this series is all about transforming the way that we think, the way we contribute to, and the way that we experience church. Now, you see, your church, your local church, is actually your tangible expression of being part of God's extensive family around the world. Your local church is part of your experience of being part of God's family. And if River Gum is your church home, then River Gum is to be your church family. And I've spoken about that concept of how I can make those assertions over the last few weeks. And so if you haven't um, caught up before, I mean, this is all a new concept 
to you then, can I encourage you to go back and watch our previous messages on this for you to get a bit more of an idea about the things that we are talking about. But one of the things we recognise is that maybe a lot of people actually haven't thought about church being family before, or maybe people ha actually haven't had a lot of experience of family here at church. And so this series is to actually help it, help in, in both of those things. Now, what we know is that when it comes to family, one of the great things to help us feel like family is when we celebrate significant milestones. And today I want to take a couple of moments just to, to recognise a significant milestone from someone within our church family, and that is Edwina Blair. Yes, she is my wife, but Edwina's turning 50 tomorrow, and, uh, and so I just want to extend to her, not only personally, but on behalf of the River Gum Church, Edwina, happy birthday to you. We hope that your 50th birthday celebrations are indeed uh, triumphant and, and enjoyable for you, which obviously I've got a, a little bit to do with. I'm hoping all my organisation goes well. But happy birthday to you, Edwina, on behalf of your River Gum family. Now, in, last week, Edwina brought to us a great message about how we go about serving family. And I'm going to be building upon that this week about how we actually go about building a family. In other words, what are some of the ways that we can actually build the sense of family here at church? You know, within the scriptures, there um, the, the teachings of, of Jesus, the word, just the, the things that Jesus said the, and the things that he modelled actually spoke to a lot of the issues around family. You know, when you think about the, the, the two most famous parables of Jesus, you know, um, a, lot, a lot of people have a bit of an idea about that, but they, for most people, they having their top two most famous parables of Jesus would either be the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan, as well as the parable of the prodigal son. Now, it's interesting that out of the top two famous, best-known parables of Jesus, one of them concerns the concept of family. And so what we're going to have a look at today, we're going to have a look at this parable of the prodigal son because it actually speaks to the notion of family. And so we're going to read through the best part of this parable itself. And then what I want you to do is have a look for all the different references to like different concepts of when it speaks to family in this parable. And what we'll see in this story is the ways that the family can actually be built up as well as ways that family experience can be eroded or even destroyed. So we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 15 in the New Testament and we're going to be starting from verse 11. The story is going to be on the screen for you to read along with us. So this is how the story goes. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death? I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead 
and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. Now, even though this parable is called the parable of the prodigal son, it's probably more appropriately called the parable of the forgiving father or the parable of the generous father. And Jesus told this parable because he wanted to tell the people about what the very nature of God in heaven is actually like, what the heavenly father is like. And so this story is all about God. You know, so whether or not it's the son in the story or whether or not it comes to us ourselves, despite our various wanderings, despite our various actions, when God sees us start coming back to him, he just can't help but rush to us. And he covers the stains that are the result of our bad choices and our mistakes that we have made. And he just rushes to celebrate the fact that we have come home to him again. You know, God wants to, wants to come and embrace you and love on you when you start coming back to him. Now, if you haven't started your journey back to God yet, can I encourage you to do so? But I understand how some of us may be a little bit hesitant because we feel like that considering what's gone on in our lives, we, we can't come back to God because we, we fear what he will do. We fear what he will be like. We think that he's, if we come back to God, he's going to sit us down and lecture us about all the things that we've done wrong. But that's not the case at all. We see from the story that if you start heading back towards God, he's looking for you. And when he sees you, even at a distance, he's going to rush to you and he's going to embrace you and love on you. You know, if that's what our Heavenly Father is actually like through what Jesus tells us here, then who wouldn't we want to be part? of this type of family? Who wouldn't want to be part of God's family if this is what our Father in heaven is actually like? Now, I want us to pause, the, you know, the story, if you like, for just for a moment, because I want to look at the story perhaps from a different way that we would ordinarily do. Maybe look at it from a different perspective that would we may immediately overlook. See, obviously, this story is about a father with God as the main character. But also, it's not just a story about a father, though. It's a story about a family. You know, obviously there's a father, but there are also two sons. There are also these brothers who are involved in the story as well. So let me ask you this. Considering what we've looked at over these past weeks, what do you think the attitude was of these two sons towards their family? What did their actions say about how these brothers viewed family? Well, let's look at the first son, the, young, the younger son, if you like. You know, in asking for his part of the estate, or, you know, asking, for, in fact, for his inheritance, he was, in fact, saying that he wanted out of the family. In actual fact, in asking for his inheritance now, he was actually saying, Dad, you are dead to me. You know, it's like you don't uh, no longer exist to me. So all this son wanted was what was owed to him what the family owed him. The son was thinking that, you know, I'm part of this family only for what I'm going to be able to get out of it, what they will be able to give me. So to this younger son, do you think he cared about what the impact of this demand would have upon his father's heart? Do you think this younger son actually cared about the hopes that the father had for what they could do together and what they could and the type of family that they could be together? Do you think this, this younger son even cared about what the impact would be upon his older brother when he left? I mean, the older brother now would need to have to step up and even have to cover all the responsibilities of this younger son now. Do you think this younger son even cared about the impact that this would have upon his brother? You see, from this younger son in the story, we see an incredibly confronting reality, and that is that you will never have an experience of family if you don't want it to be family in the first place. Now, things may have been different in the past, but now this younger son didn't really want to be part of the family at all. He was only there to get something out of it, not to be part of it. He didn't care about the father. He didn't care about his brother. He only cared about what he wanted to do. He only cared about what he could get from the family. Man, that's, that's quite a, a sobering reality from this sort of story, isn't it? But what about the older brother? Well, the brother who's always been there, slaving away, as, as he calls it, always doing the right thing. You see, from this older brother's perspective, you know, despite all his slaving, despite all doing all the right things all the time, he had a very, he got upset. Because he felt, you know what, this family isn't providing me what I think it should. 
You see, when the young, when his irresponsible brother comes home, this older brother got, gets really upset. He gets angry, he gets resentful and bitter about the fact of what the, the father doesn't celebrate, the fact that his brother's come home. And this, this older brother comes back and goes, hang on a minute. I've been doing all this for the family. So I should be getting back in return. It's sort of like a, a, a family is supposed to be a quid pro quo sort of stuff. I do this for you, you do this for me. That's how family is supposed to be. And clearly then, because you haven't done for me like I have done for you, then clearly that I'm not part of this family. Then clearly that this is not actually family at all. From the older brother, we see another attitude which actually erodes and can actually destroy the experience of family. You see, you'll never have an experience of family if your family needs to repay you for the things that you've done for it. You see, if this parable is representative of God's family, then I come back to a question which I asked in when we tried to kick off this, this series back in March before we were rudely interrupted with all the COVID stuff. The question that I asked in, that, in, in March was simply this one. Is it possible that if we have lost the sense of family in the church, it's because we don't think family, we think me. How were these two brothers more concerned about themselves than they were about the family? You know, we have a story here about the gracious, loving, generous Father, our Heavenly Father. And yet we see the attitude and the intent of, the, of his two children, of these brothers. Tell me, how do things need to change for this younger brother to not want to have to ask for the inheritance in the first place? Where he doesn't need to ask and try and get what the family owes him for simply being there. And what needs to change for the older brother, for him to want to have us to celebrate with his father about the fact that his brother is actually there and, and would cause him to actually think that the family doesn't need to repay him for the things that he has done for it. What would need to change for these two brothers to have a different experience and a different perspective on family? Well, it comes down to one simple word, and that is selflessness. You see, selfishness destroys and erodes a sense of family, but selflessness actually builds family up. Selfishness actually caused both of these sons to act in a particular way and look at the impact they had upon the family dynamic. But notice here that the sense of family didn't simply come from the nature of the father. You know, the father in the story did as much as he possibly could to actually create a sense of family and an experience of family for his sons, for these particular brothers. See, the sense of family doesn't simply come from one person wanting to be family and then everybody else doing whatever they want to. You know, I'm sure that some of us know only too well. You know, we've done everything we possibly can to create a sense of family with the people that, that, that we live with, the people within our immediate families. We've done everything we possibly can, but... That's far from your experience because, well, let's just call it as it is. You know, some of our immediate family, you know, they're, they're just incredibly selfish. And despite, despite all the things that you have tried to do, they're just thinking about themselves. They're just doing their own thing. And when you have that type of experience, it's incredibly painful and disappointing considering the effort that you have gone to to try and create a sense of family in that. See, the experience of family only comes from our selflessness towards family. Now, that's true for home, and it's also true for church as well. You see, your experience of family within the church is very much determined by my selflessness towards the church, and vice versa with that. You see, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 says this. It says, look out for one another's interests, not just your own. You know, what are these words actually about? Well, it's about selflessness, isn't, isn't it? See, selflessness brings out the best in others and selflessness brings out the best in ourselves. See, do you happen to realise that God's favourite place to teach you selflessness is in the midst of family? You know, when, when parents are trying to teach their kids to share 
What is that actually trying to teach them? It's actually trying to teach them about selflessness, isn't it? See, the parents are trying to teach their kids about how they can go about caring for others and loving people more and more, particularly before they then take their next step in life and going out of the world and by going to school. See, God is trying to teach me and God is trying to teach you about selflessness. And God knows that the, one of the best ways of places that we can learn to do that more is within the context of the church family. You see, we learn to be family through learning to be selfless. And when we are selfless towards one another, church becomes more like family. And just like it was when we were kids, the more that we can learn to be selfless in family, the more then we can be selfless towards the world. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, following Jesus is actually about expanding our hearts so that we are able to add to the number of people that we love. See, the more people that we can be selfless towards, the more people that we love. See, we aren't simply to be selfless towards the people that we, we live with at our homes, our part of our immediate families. We are to learn selflessness in our church family so that the church can be more like family, so that we can become more like our Heavenly Father. And then we can take that selfless heart to the world. So why is selflessness so important? Because selflessness is an expression of love. You know, serving is an expression of love like Edwina talked about last week. But selflessness too is also an expression of love. And what we know more than anything else is that it is love which makes the experience a family. The expression of love is through acts of service. Expressions of love is through selflessness and through many other ways as well. But love is a thing that makes family. And without selflessness, it is very difficult to love and be family together. So to finish up today, here are some basic selfless things that you can do to help create and help build a sense of family here at church, whether it be at Rivergum or whatever church that you are a part of. And whether that, that be also being COVID times now or when things are more as they used to be. All of these things can be done right now to help build family. So the first thing that you can do to help build family is simply this, show up. You know, do you remember when your older brother showed up when you're being picked on by some other people at school? You remember when, when he showed up, you know, how much that made you feel closer to your brother? Or do you remember when your sister just happened to show up with some flowers that they, she picked from the garden when you were feeling sick? Do you remember when she showed up, you know, how much that made you feel closer to your sister? You know, showing up actually forges the relationship between siblings. And showing up is actually a selfless, selfless act, particularly when we don't need to show up, but we do so anyway. So when it comes to church, show up. Show up on Sundays. Show up to your connect group. Show up to your church relationship. Show up to serve. You know, when there are times when, you know, when we couldn't be bothered or when there's times when, you know, there's completing priorities on, on what, what you could do or, you know, when, when, when there is times when we think it doesn't matter if we show up, show up nonetheless. Because showing up actually forges the brother and sister relationship together closer, tighter, deeper together. Because what we have to remember is that, that you are my brother and, and, and you are my sister, that we are brothers and sisters together. We're not distant cousins or you know, anything else. We're, we are brothers and sisters. And what forges the brother and sister relationship closer than anything else is simply showing up. Showing up is an act of selflessness. Now, it's... It's hard to have a, have a sense of family when we don't show up. It's hard to have a sen sense of family when they don't show up, when those other people don't show up. And I know that it's really hard at the moment considering all our COVID restrictions, but nonetheless, we can still show up individually. We can still show up in small groups, not just showing up in the big gathering way, although you know, we'll be able to do that again very soon. But showing up is actually a really important way that we can build family and build the experience of family together. So that's the first thing that we can do. The second way that we can build family is actually by sitting down. We show up and then we can sit down. Now, sitting down to a meal with members of your church family is a selfless act. 
I mean, it's your house, it's probably going to be your food and it's your time. Now, for some of us, as soon as you hear me say that, you know, that might now come with a whole lot of sense of obligations and, and concerns and things like that. Because what it sounds like is that, you know, that I'm asking you to try and make friends with more people. You know, and the reality is that for many of us, we have enough friends in our lives. We've already reached our acquaintance quota. So there, you know, that, what I've just said there, you know, comes with a whole lot of pressure and obligations upon you. For others of us, you know, we know that, you know, through the course of our lives, you know, we've really struggled to make friends. And so, you know, having the opportunity to have a meal with someone, you know, that, that makes us feel a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, we've, we've always struggled with making friends in the past. But here's the thing that actually helps build a sense of family. See, with people at church, you are trying to make new friends. You're not trying to add to your friend list. All you're trying to do is be family together. See, a meal with people from your church is not about trying to make friends. It's about being family. I mean, how many of us, when we were growing up, we sat our parents down and said, Mum and Dad, you can't have any more children. Because quite frankly, I've reached the quota in my life of the number of brothers or sisters that I can handle. I simply just don't have another, enough room for another brother or sister. Do we ever sit down and have that conversation with our parents? Of course we did. You know, as brothers and sisters came along, we simply made room for another brother or another sister. We wouldn't dream about having that type of conversation because that is because we're thinking family. We're not thinking about them being friends or whatever like that. We're thinking that they are part of our family. But here's the thing, a meal with people at your church is not about trying to make friends. It's about being family together because these are your brothers. These are your sisters. And so when we actually change our perspective, inviting people over for a meal actually becomes a different prospect for us. I mean, you'd invite your, your crazy cousin or your strange aunt that smells like mothballs. You'd invite them over for a dinner, wouldn't you? Because, you know, all you're trying to do is be family together. They're part of your family, so I'm going to invite them together. You're not inviting them over to be your friends. You're inviting them over because they are part of your family. Same thing goes with church. Invite people over, not simply to, to be friends. Even though they might be a, a good friend for you, you're inviting them over so you can be family together. And when we look at it from that perspective, so much pressure comes off and we can relax and simply be family together because we view people differently when we see them as family. So this is one of two of the ways that we can help build family, that we can show up, we can sit down, and the third way is that we can invite in. You know, from Jesus' parable that we looked at just a few moments ago, we saw that simply expecting the family to do for us is actually an expression of, of self selfishness. The two brothers showed that very clearly. They were, they were selfish in, in their own particular ways. And how that actually gets played out in the church today is a lot of like this, that you, you have to invite me, that you are the one who has to make the effort, not me. You know, we're just going to stand here, we're just going to sit here and wait for others to come to us. You know, you are to give, I am to get. You are to do, I am to receive. Now, if you have that sort of attitude, tell me, what's your experience of family like for you, if that's your particular attitude? You see, selflessness towards a family acts very differently. And instead of selflessness, you know, it's a, you know instead selflessness actually says, you know, I'm going to invite you into my world rather than waiting for you to invite me into yours. I'm going to be family towards you by, you know, inviting you into a conversation, inviting you over for dinner, inviting you to the movies, inviting you to, to come over for a swim, inviting you to be a part of something. You see, invitation shows your attitude towards family. Because we recognise that I'm not going to wait for you. I'm going to come and invite you myself because I'm wanting to invite you to be family together with me. You know, and on the theme of invitation, can I just extend to everyone today an invitation to join one of our great connect groups? 
Connect groups are the best way for you, that you can can be part of God's family in a real and real and, and deeper way. Now, if you've been waiting for an invitation to join a connect group before, here it is. I want to personally invite you to join one of our connect groups. Now, in our in our e-news, which I hope that you're subscribed to, we regularly detail each week about the connect groups that are available that you can join. Now, if you're not subscribed to e-news, can I encourage you to go onto our website and subscribe to e-news and you can find out about the connect groups that are available for you to be a part of. Now, if you're inquiring about a, a connect group, you know, it's not a commitment to, to a, a, a connect group, but an inquiry is not a commitment. You can test drive a connect group just to see what it's like. But we want to extend, on behalf of all the connect groups, I want to extend to you an invitation to join one of our small connect groups where you can really feel like family with a group of other people from River Gum. So I hope that you may consider to do that. If you want to find out more information about connect groups, just email me now. The details are at the bottom of your screen for you to be able to do that. So the way we build family, show up, sit down, invite in, and lastly, help out. Help out. You know, helping others in your family is an incredibly selfless thing to do. You know, you can't help your family without actually being selfless in some particular way. You know, is it selfless with your time, selfless with your ears as you listen to them, selfless with your patience, with your resources, and sometimes even selfless with your money. I mean, how many times has your biological family helped you move, helped you renovate, helped you cook, helped you clean, helped you to, to talk through stuff, helped you to be reassured, helped you not to be worried, helped you to pray? How many times has your, has your family, your biological family, helped you with that? See, family is perhaps the most selfless when it actually helps. So if church is to be family, it becomes family when it helps. So if you want church to be more like family, help someone in the church family. You know, you, you will have more opportunities to help when you show up, when you sit down, and when you invite in, and when you get to know your church family a whole lot more. Knowing your family a whole lot more will help you know how you can help them out. The more you can help them out, the more they will be like family. You know, these are, are four very simple things to help build family. Show up, sit down, invite in, and help out. I want to pray for you right now. Gracious Father, we want to thank you so much for the, the further instruction you're giving us uh, about how we can be more family together, be part of your family in greater ways. And we thank you for the lesson that we learn from Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. Gracious Father, really speak into our hearts about our attitude and our intent when it comes to, to being a part of family and what we can do to help build family, Lord God. Lord, I know more than anything else that you want River Gum to be a to, to be a place where families experience in its fullness as you desire it to be. And I pray, Lord God, that you continue to challenge us, that you continue to transform us into the people, Lord God, who relate to each other more as brothers and sisters in the faith than anything else. Not as distant cousins, but as brothers and sisters who are united together with you as our Heavenly Father. Gracious Father, I want to pray for people who need to start their journey back to you today. I want to pray, Lord God, that they may not be fearful or hesitant about who you may be and what you may do, but rather learning from this parable that you are a God who just embraces and loves on us and wants to celebrate the fact that we've come back to you. Gracious Father, give people the encouragement today to come back to you, to acknowledge where they've been, but come back to you knowing that your being with you is the best place on earth and for all eternity to be. Gracious Father, we pray this now through your sons. Holy name. Amen.
for a slave, trading your righteousness for shame. Despite all my pride and foolish ways, caught in your infinite Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, next week we are going to continue our family series as we explore how we can go about loving family more. I really hope that you can join us. For now, make sure you check your e-news, subscribe to e-news if you don't actually get that in your email inbox every Friday, because that is the best way to stay in touch with everything going on in the life of our church. Bless you this week. If you need anything, make sure you reach out because we're here to help you in any way we can. We love you all. And we'll see you soon.